This is a 25-year-old iMac G3, a computer I bought for $30 at a recycling center when I was just a wee lad because I had a dream to teach myself how to edit videos. And way back then, the best computer for editing was a Mac. Except there was a problem. On the side of this iMac G3 was something super important missing. It's got USB ports, Ethernet ports, but no Firewire. This iMac didn't support editing video at all. But what exactly is a Firewire port? What made it so important? And why the heck do we not use it anymore? Where the heck has it gone? Well, we're about to go down the rabbit hole to find out. Tracing Firewire from Apple's secret labs in the 1980s to its tragic end. Ha, huh, poor Firewire. But for real, there was one meeting that literally killed this entire technology in one go, making this kind of boring cable actually super interesting. Okay, to understand what this kind of bizarre technology was, we need to go back to the 1980s, specifically 1986, because deep inside Apple was a group of engineers who had a crazy idea. See, back in the 80s and the 90s, connecting anything to a computer was like Russian roulette. You'd have these things called parallel ports that worked half the time. And for anything professional, you were stuck with this thing called what is it called? SCSI port is short for Small Computer System Interface Port. Super catchy, guys. <laughs> now, even though these cables technically worked, they could cost up to $100 and required manual device IDs for up to 15 devices. And if you got one setting wrong, it just, they would just stop working. So when Apple's engineers started talking about one cable for everything, most people thought they were kind of nuts. But this impossible vision had some serious engineering talent behind it. You had Michael Tina as chief architect, and John Rubenstein leading the charge on Steve Jobs and Apple's digital hub strategy. And the thing was, they weren't just making another cable here. The idea is that this standard, which became Firewire, could talk directly to device to device, essentially bypassing computers completely. And they designed two connector types, a six pin that delivered 45 watts of power and a smaller four pin version for smaller devices. But the real breakthrough was called isynchronous data transfer. Firewire could guarantee bandwidth in real time, reserving up to 80% of its speed for time critical video and audio streams. Pretty sick. But having brilliant engineers and revolutionary technology doesn't mean that it'll actually work in the real world. The early prototypes of Firewire were a mess and this peer-to-peer -peer approach sounded great on paper, but in practice, they got device conflicts and timing issues and just a lot of stuff went wrong. Not to mention the problems they had with longer cables. PC manufacturers were skeptical about the cost and complexity. Sony and Intel were interested, but they kind of just watched from the sidelines. So Apple made a decision that would either make or break everything. Today we are officially rolling out Firewire as part of our product line on the motherboard of every new Power Mac G3. Instead of keeping it proprietary like every other Apple technology, they submitted it to IEEE as an open standard. This was either a brilliant strategy or just nuts. But IEEE 1394 was launched in 1995, a port standard that supported 400 megabits per second when USB 1.1 was crawling at 12. Bro, it wasn't even a competition, holy dooly. Now Firewire was the technology that made editing on iMacs possible. It provided the data speed needed to transfer big video files from cameras and hard drives. Remember, this was the early 2000s. iMacs were coming with 40 gig of spinning hard drive space. But here's where my heartbreak with Firewire really began. See, as an 11 year old kid, I specifically bought this iMac G3 so I could learn how to edit videos on it. Everyone on YouTube was telling me that Apple computers were the best computers for editing and specifically that iMovie was unreal. So I walked to my local recycling center and was so surprised to see they had this iMac G3 sitting there. I didn't even think twice. I gave them all my pocket money and I carried this thing home. But when I got home, I was quickly disappointed. When I booted Mac OS, there was no iMovie, there was no GarageBand, it was just good old Mac OS. The iMac G3 that I'd so hopefully bought had no Firewire port and it didn't have the specs to run iMovie. I legit couldn't even start, I, you couldn't even install iMovie. I wouldn't get to edit on a Mac for like another five years when I saved up for my first MacBook Pro, but that's a, that's a story for another time. But everyone else with an iMac, well, they had Firewire. And for about five years, Firewire absolutely freaking dominated. See, this was the mid 2000s and every DIY filmmaker flocked to these Canon and Sony cameras. Even professional recording studios would run pre-Sonus interfaces, all of which featured Firewire as their way to connect with each other. Firewire quickly became the standard that enabled creating stuff. I have a lot of nostalgia for this time. It was the start of YouTube. It was the start of what it meant to be a creator and to make stuff at home. Everyone around me seemed like they were learning how to make music and editing videos videos. It was just, ah, it feels like it was what kicked off what we have right now. And Firewire weirdly was part of all of that. But it wasn't just for newbies like me. It was built for professionals, people who needed reliability when it came to cables. And then Steve Jobs went and did something crazy. He put a thousand songs 
in your pocket at a time where putting that much music onto anything would take hours. Now at the time, everyone was so focused on the storage, but the real magic was the speed. A full CD transfer to your iPod would take 10 seconds compared to the minutes it would take over USB. This wasn't just a feature, it was essentially the entire user experience. Pretty insane. And by 2002, Apple thought they'd conquered the world with Firewire. This was how every bit of technology was gonna communicate with each other. But then USB 2.0 showed its face. Recently, I was packing for a trip with my family. It was our first flight with our little baby. And it felt like I spent 15 minutes just trying to collect every single cable I needed to charge all of my things. To be fair, I'm not the most organized person. I have laptop chargers, phone chargers, camera chargers, backup cables. I swear I pack more cables than I pack underwear. Is that just me? <laughs> And honestly, it just gets to the point where my backpack looks like it's full of spaghetti. And somehow, I still forget the one actual cable that I need. Friggin' stitch, bro. And it got me thinking, you've got packing cubes for your toiletries and your clothes, why not for your charging cables? Well, I'll do you one better. Because the legends of Bayesius have created these epic power adapters and power banks, literally made for traveling. Honestly, you could just travel with their CJ11 charger and you'd be set. You can't forget the cable because it's built in. Bro, I just love retractable things, oh my gosh. And it can deliver 67 watts, which means I can charge my MacBook Pro, no dramas. Plus it's got two extra USB-C ports for charging three things at the same time, super helpful. Or if you need more flexibility, the CG11 has a built-in travel adapter. It has 70 watt fast charging and an integrated cable, plus you can plug in all of your other adapters. So if you're in a different country, this thing is so sick. But honestly, I just think I'll full send and use the CR11 power bank. It has a 20,000 milliamp hour capacity and a built-in cable as well. That's essentially three full iPhone chargers and it's airline approved. This thing is a beast. And now my tangled mess of a bag is now just three items. No more cable spaghetti. So if you're looking for a better option when traveling, check out the Bayesius Enercore series. Head to the link in my description and thank you so much to Bayesius for supporting this video. See, USB 2.0 launched with a transfer speed of 480 megabits per second. Finally, some real competition for Firewire. And pretty quickly, the tech press was calling it the Firewire killer. USB 2.0 had higher theoretical speed built into every PC motherboard. And it was backed by Intel and Microsoft. And honestly, for the first time, Apple looked kind of vulnerable, but then they came back swinging. Their response was to release Firewire 800. You know they had that in the back lab somewhere for ages. It featured double the speed, longer cables, backward compatibility, and it actually destroyed USB 2.0 in real world performance. And Apple thought they'd won the war once again, but really they were about to lose everything because of a single kind of greedy decision. See, back in 1999, Steve Jobs learned that IBM was making hundreds of millions of dollars from patent licensing. And so Jobs started thinking, here's Apple giving away their revolution technology basically for free while other companies were printing money from their intellectual property. I mean, I can't blame him for thinking this. Why shouldn't Apple get paid for Firewire? So he made the call that kind of destroyed everything and Apple increased the Firewire licensing fees from $0 to $1 per port. $1 per port. Your computer could have seven ports on it. That's seven bucks. And as you can probably guess, the industry lost their freaking mind. So many manufacturers had already adopted the Firewire standard. I mean, for a three port chip that cost $5 to make, manufacturers suddenly owed $3 to Apple on what was meant to be an open standard. As you can guess, PC makers felt betrayed and chip makers called it highway robbery. But the real disaster was about to come from the one company Apple couldn't afford to lose. See, all this time, Intel was considering adding Firewire directly into their motherboard chipsets. Essentially Firewire built in on every single PC. Huge. It would have essentially been USB, and Apple would have won the interface war permanently. But Intel executives were furious about being blindsided by the licensing fee. And that's when Apple realized they made a pretty big mistake. It didn't take long for Apple to backtrack and they dropped the fee from $1 to 25 cents per system, which is way more reasonable. They even issued public apologies and tried to repair the relationships with chip makers, as well as begging Intel to reconsider. But it was kind of too late. Trust was broken and the momentum for Firewire was dead. And what happened next might be the most painful irony in tech history. <laughs> Instead of using Firewire, Intel chose to use USB 2.0 as their standard and integrated it directly into their motherboard chipset. Everyone got free USB ports on every single PC and the network effect took over, for real. The insane part is that the inferior technology won 
purely because it was free. I mean, it makes sense, but still far out. Now, Firewire still stayed a premium option for professionals, but the rest of the world moved to USB 2.0 as the good enough option. The flipping future was sold for a dollar, dude. A dollar. Firewire lost despite being superior in every technical measure. It was faster, more reliable, better engineered, and honestly enabled entire creative industries, which is insane. But it was kind of owned by the wrong people at the wrong time with the wrong business strategy. And in hindsight, Firewire could have ultimately become USB-C. That could have been an Apple move. Son of a biscuit. By 2012, Apple quietly removed the Firewire port from the MacBook Pro. I remember this so clearly because I had to buy so many freaking dongles for all my music equipment. <laughs> Holy dooly, it was just a daisy chain of dongles. There's legends out there still recording music on old Firewire interfaces. And to me, that is pretty flippin' legendary, far out. And really shows how powerful Firewire 800 still is now, all these years later. And technically, Firewire hasn't disappeared completely either. Firewire didn't really die, it kind of just evolved into something better, something smarter. Apple's Thunderbolt ports, the technology they use, still carries Firewire's DNA. High speed, daisy chaining, power delivery, peer-to-peer -peer architecture, all the good stuff about Firewire. But this time, Apple partnered with Intel from day one, which is why we all use USB-C now. Thunderbolt is what Firewire could have become with the right strategy. But to me, Firewire's legacy isn't even really about a port or about a cable. It's about the creative revolution, if you can call it that, that happened around the same time that was enabled by this cable. Every indie film was shot on a DV camera and every album was recorded through a Firewire interface. A whole generation of people who learned how to make stuff used this technology. The Firewire port may be gone, but the role it played in all of this creativity honestly makes it pretty freaking legendary. I should try and buy some old Firewire tech. That would be pretty sick. Yo, if you want to watch me goof around with some more legendary tech, check out this video.